Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Armory Show and to Armory Live. It's my pleasure to introduce the final talk of the fair, Funding Creative Change, Artists, Neighbours and Community Transformation. Full biographies of all our panellists can be found on the Armory Live section of our website, so I do encourage you to go there for more information. There will be some time at the end for all your questions. But in the meantime, please join me in welcoming our speakers to the stage. Hello. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Does everyone do a quick mic check up here? Check. Hello. There we go. Beautiful. Hello. Um, thank you very much to the Armory for having us. I want to note that I, before everybody arrived, I was like lying on this ramp and wanted to do it from I here. I have the evidence. She, there is evidence. Uh, because access is a beautiful thing, so I just want everyone to note that more ramps in the world are great. Um, but to get started, I'm Dina Hagag. I am the president and CEO of United States Artists, which is a national arts funding organization headquartered in Chicago uh, that funds about 50 artists every year with an unrestricted $50,000 award. Uh, we were founded when the NEA was defunded by Congress in the 90s um, and when our federal government pretty much decided to no longer support artists at an individual level. So this. This topic is very near and dear to me personally and to my organization largely, and I'm very excited to be here with our panelists. Does everyone just want to introduce themselves super, super quickly? Hank, you want to kick us off? You just did. Oh. I'm, I'm, I'm Hank. Touche. I am uh, really fortunate to be here with all of you all. I am a follower of the others, I'm, and uh, I'm Deb's son. You know what that means. If you know what that means, if you don't, you don't. Hi, I'm Victoria. Thank you for coming. I'm so excited to see so many familiar faces here, which is really exciting. Um, I'm an independent consultant right now, graduated from business school last year, and I'm on this panel in my capacity as board member on the Brooklyn Museum in Creative Time. Hello, everyone. I am Kemi Alaysami, and um, I've taken to introducing myself as the granddaughter of Cora Elizabeth Miles and Florence Alaysami, and I also I am the executive director of the Laundromat Project here in New York City. And I'm really excited to be here with all of you and all of you. Yeah. And I think one thing about this panel is I think we're having two different conversations a little bit. I think we're having conversations on how artists organize community or how they define that. And then also a little bit about how do you f support artists how, in whichever ways we define that together on this stage and then with you in the audience. We'll talk for maybe another 30 to 35 minutes and then we'll open for questions. But if you have an absolutely burning question from the audience, feel free to shoot a hand up and we'll try to get it in the conversation as we move. And one thing I think I wanted to start with um, for each of our panelists here is if we're even thinking about community, I'm wondering what that, who that is for you. Like literally, who do you do this work for? Who are your people? Why are you here? Um, and, and who do you feel beholden to? Hank. Okay. Uh, well. I'm here as part of a collective called Four Freedoms, which uh, w works to put uh, civic discourse into, uh, c critical discourse into civic and political discourse through fine art thinking. We have an installation that's connecting the two uh, peers. We've done uh, about uh, 300 billboards, 150 exhibitions, uh, over 150 town halls across the country. Most recently, we did a, a Congress where we brought delegates from all 50 states plus DC and Puerto Rico uh, to Los Angeles to really convene and discuss what the role of create, creatives and creative institutions in an election year would and could and should be. I see a lot of my collaborators here. Raise your hands if you are one of them. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. So uh, just in case people were wondering. <laughs> um, and so my community, frankly, is all, everyone who's alive and wants to be alive and realize the value of that. I think we take that for granted. Um, as a person of African descent who was raised in the United States, uh, my humanity was a, put into question from the moment I was born. And I would like uh, to change that question into an exclamation point. <laughs> um, I'm in community with people who believe that art is a tool for social change. So I think that's probably everyone in this room. 
Um, certainly everyone here I've, I've worked with in different capacities or um, tried to support and encourage the work of. I think um, Ann Pasternak was a huge champion for me early on. I did an internship at Creative Time in 2012 and really fell in love with the way that she empowered artists. And so I've tried to follow her trajectory and be in community with people that she um, has championed throughout her incredible career. It's a, a grounding force for me. Mm -hmm. I love that. Um, let's see. So the Laundromat Project, our mission is to advance artists and neighbors as change agents in their own communities. So this idea of community is really embedded in the work. And over 15 years, we turned 15 years old this year, um, we have worked with 170 incredible artists, mainly artists of color. And we have connected and engaged and done the work in communities of color all across New York City. So that for me is very much the grounding of this idea of the kind of community we're in partnership with. I have learned so much from the artists we've worked with, the communities they've encountered and engaged us with. Um, I also really think about the ecosystem that we're in and doing this work. And that includes you guys, it includes um, uh, other peer organizations, uh, many that you guys are connected to, et cetera. Like, how do we do this work together? And we each have the parts that we do and the parts that we hold. Um, and the idea is to move towards thriving, right? Like, be in community together so that we can thrive. I'm really struck. Oh, did you want to say something? Are you going to be bad? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I was going to ask the people in the audience to ask that of the people next to them because it's such a good question. Look at you being so bad. <laughs> but look at us. I mean, every time I get somewhere, the first thing that I like to do, hey, Dina, um, is I acknowledge the people that I'm with. And I think we take for granted who we're sitting next to, how we got to where we are, and how we got next to one another. Um, in this moment of the coronavirus, where everyone's like trying to figure out how to navigate uh, how we relate to each other, we're hyper conscious of it, but we're more conscious about how to avoid each other and how to engage. So I just was like thinking, you know. Does everyone want to take a minute to talk to their neighbor? You don't have a choice. Especially if you don't know them about that's what's the question though? You had the good question. The question who is who, who do you do this for? Who are your people? Sorry. Good job, Hank. Okay. Now that Hank has disrupted our peace, I bring you back. All of our civil liberties. Um, I'd be very eager when we open it up to sort of see if anyone heard something from a neighbor that was particularly compelling. Um, yeah, I think one thing that, has everyone seen the like Hillary Clinton documentary on Hulu that came out last week? Okay, it's a whole thing, but, but. Uh, she gave this speech at Wellesley as an undergrad. She was the valedictorian or the student elected to give this speech. And I guess um, she had prepared a speech and a governor, a Republican governor, was invited to be the commencement speaker. And she graduated in the late 60s. And so there was clearly so much political dissent across our nation. Um, at that point in time, Martin Luther King, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. had been assassinated. Kennedy was forthcoming. I mean, it was really bad. And this is Wellesley, it's an all-girls school. And the Republican governor gets up there and is like, you young ladies just need to like calm down. Like young people need to calm down. And I guess Hillary Clinton was so, I'm like ruining this for all of you, I'm very, very sorry. But she was so affected by this that she got up there and didn't really give her speech and instead responded to this. But one sentence, because at USA we're stuck in this a lot. Um, how do we defend what artists do? And one sentence that sh I remember from her speech that's just been sitting with me for two days is that people dissent when they are desperately trying to uh, kind of forge their identity in the world and you're not letting them, right? Like that's what's happening. I think about that because I actually think from our very, very young age, that's what art can do. 
it like helps you start to formulate your identity. You self-actualize with the music you love, the food you enjoy, the artists you're honored to be around, the music you watch, I mean, the movies you watch. And so I'm curious, and also Victoria's, I love that you brought up Ann Pasternak and Deb and your grandparents, the people we want to honor. Are there certain things that sit in your memory as like art moments you really remember as like helping you self-actualize, helping you form your identity? Um, Do not ask the audience to answer this, but <laughs> you might want to also start thinking when Hank's like, what do all of you think? But yes, Kemi. I would say probably my earliest memory of art and culture is something that mattered was Festac 1977. Mm -hmm. I'm uh, half Nigerian, my father's Nigerian, my mother's African American from Maryland. Um, and we moved to um, Nigeria, to Lagos. I was uh, six uh, in 1977 in April, so I missed it by two months. It ended at the end of February. But it was still buzzing in the air. And there was this big thing that happened and all these people came and they had been in this city that was now my new home and, and that I ended up, I lived there for another 10 years after that. But that is by far the earliest memory I have of this idea of culture. And it was this Pan-African moment and it happened in the place that I got to call home and still get to call home. I think for me it was at the Prado. I don't remember exactly how old I was, but I was pretty young. My mom, who's here, um, had taken me on a trip to the Prado and I saw Velasquez's Las Meninas um, and saw the Infanta Margarita. And I remember our tour guide sharing a little bit of the story of her unhappiness in that moment and feeling this sort of cross historical connection um, was really powerful for me. I was of similar age, and I felt that, oh, there, there are people who've lived on this world before me, and because of painting, I'm able to see a little bit of insight into what her life was like and create some historical empathy. I think I probably at the time wasn't thinking about it in those terms, but was, was like, oh, art needs to be cared for so that later other people can see and understand the world that came before them. I think that was a really powerful moment for me. Yeah, well, I connect art to everything because it is life. I grew up in the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture, uh, 135th Street in Lenox. My mother was a photo curator and photographer and historian, and within my house, but also everything we d I did throughout my life, literally after school every day, I was put into contact with um, images and documents created to remind people of African descent of their great contributions to our society. And we don't think about um, history as a create, telling history as a creative act, um, that Arthur Schomburg um, deciding to collect um, these books, these images, these uh, writings uh, and documents of people of African descent was that creation of an archive was both a political act and a creative act uh, that uh, literally dictates and has shaped my life. I am going to stay on the vi virus theme. Uh, my cousin in our project we did, Question Bridge Black Males, uh, answered a question about uh, the negativity within our communities sometimes and he answered about like, but think, love being a virus, he said that is also contagious. I think knowledge is also, can be a virus that's contagious and we don't think about the positive feedback loops and the way that we can project positivity and creativity in the world through, through our work. And I think my mother infected me, she was infected in a very early age by my grandmother Ruth uh, and her aunts and uncles and I've been infected with it by you and through your parents. And I always tell Victoria, uh, I'm going to start a business program at Harvard because she did a business program at Stanford. And I was like, why are you going from the arts world to business? And I, I think we also don't recognize the way that commerce and industry is also part of the creative storytelling that we should be applying, especially in context of an art fair. Yeah. And I think to kind of pick that up, if we're talking about commerce and industry, Hank, you've put politics in the space. Victoria, you brought up. Um, recognizing that somebody had to care for art, like this idea that that was in the psyche. Kemi, it's like every pore in your body is like oozing care for artists all the time. I joke that Kemi's the like nonprofit arts deity I pray to on a daily basis. 
How often do I contact you? It was like, what do I do? And she's just like, just do this, just do this. She's also very cool. Yeah, but I'm curious about then to how how are we how are we exhibiting that care? And I want to maybe not just stick to like give an artist money, though like no one loves doing that more than me. But like that sort of funding stream aside, what are the ways in which you've noticed people care or tend to artists? I think leading from a place of yes is really powerful. Um, especially coming out of business school, a lot of really great, a lot of my colleagues from business school who I respect, so often their idea for great businesses is rooted in what others have done before. Mm. Someone did this, there's proof of concept, I'm gonna change it in this little way and go from there. And I think what artists do really well is that in the art world, it, People see through that. You're not able to take someone else's idea, repurpose it as your own without really putting your own spin on it and gaining respect. Um, I think that there's like a, a transparency here that really rewards risk taking and leading from a place of yes, saying I'll stand with you as you take that risk and help clear pathways if I can and advocate for you. In addition to, of course, financial resources are always great, but I think just being in the same room and saying, I'll stand with you is quite powerful as well. Mm. Yeah, Hank wants me also to mention Kickstarter, where I worked before I went to business school, um, which was a place of yes. We took on every project that we could handle on the platform and, and often said, if we can find support for this, let's make it happen. And so I think there are tools and resources like that that you can be in community with other people who also lead from a place of yes and are willing to put their time and resources behind new ideas. Just building on that, because I, I say yes to all of that. Um, <laughs> Uh, and the word I, that came to me was really uh, leaning into trust and saying that we trust artists. I think there's not enough room and not enough ways we can say that. And we get to say that with resources. Uh, we get to say that with time. We get to say that with um, space to fail, to try, to do it again, to do it a different way, to do it in community with other people. Um, the tagline that, uh, uh, that we have at the Laundromat Project is that we make art, we build community, and we create change. And creating the space for all of that to happen in different rhythms and in different orders um, is so much of the work. And just holding on to that part about building community, which is the center of that, like that, those six words. To me, if we create space for folks to connect, to be together, to have someone that you can call and you can email, to know who that is, to, yeah. to proactively connect folks, whatever that looks like, everything else can kind of do what it needs to do if community is held in the center. So to me, that's such a big part of the way that um, I feel I've come to the work from the different spaces and ways that it has been reinforced as a positive for me and seeing how it kind of affects um, artists' ability to do the work, to try something, to, to, to feel like there's someone and something greater holding them in doing that incredible work that they do for us and with us. Do you have an answer? You know my answer. Say it again. Um, I think it's, I don't, well, fundamentally, I, 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 my new mission and is, what is it? The oh, Wide Awakes. No, no, oh. yeah, yeah, see? Uh, oh, no. It is the mission. She's coming to my studio on Thursday. But my real new mission is to, I think, what, and, and Ambassador Gaspard and I did a great program with my mother in South Africa, uh, with my mother's Black Portraitures Congress, um, is to really, and you, uh, when you were uh, ambassador to the United States, raise your hand so people know you're talking about. Uh, he brought Sanford Biggers and my mother and uh, did an incredible panel with uh, a, a South African artist named Nicholas Flobo, um, who sat on stage and became Yoda, which was incredible, uh, and, said, and, and said things that really changed the direction of my life. He said that um, we need to live in tomorrow before we get there. That way we, don't have to be we won't be surprised when we get there. He said the problem with... Uh, South Africa post-apartheid is that people weren't 
uh, living in the freedom they wanted. So when it happened, they didn't know what to do with it and wound up in some ways um, re-enacting some of the, po the problems that um, were created through colonialism. And I s realized um, that we all have much more capacity and as really as artists and create, with creative thinkers, much more responsibility to society than we actually take. Uh, we live in a society that's desperately in need of creative minds and we have relegated ourselves and been relegated to the perimeter, often to even entertainment. And I, my mission is to put the creative thinkers in the center and I think all of those non-creative people who know how to actually, you know, still, um, can, they can be the engine that drives our society. They should be uh, the engine and we should be uh, driving. Yeah. And, and so what I'm really investigated in is finding those people who don't see themselves as creative to tap them to find their creative sides, but also for us who are investigated, involved in the creative side to like really be a stronger part of the infrastructure that uh, helps d designs and builds our world. Yeah, one thing we track at USA a lot is um, I think to, when you're talking about putting artists at the center is when you ask folks who don't identify as artists and will also, they'll vaguely want to tell you that like someone in their family watercolors, like they have like a sense, right? And we love that. Like we love everyone's aunt who is watercoloring. Like I am that person. I'm not an artist at all. But one thing that comes up a lot is um, I don't think we encourage people to have imaginations very safely. And so if a public can't have, if we're already struggling here, I think we know that publics don't even really know how to have an imagination around who or what artists do. And this is everywhere from, um, the world would look really different if TV, popular TV shows and movies had better depictions of who artists are, right? And what they're actually contributing to society. So it's not like Phoebe on Friends singing about a smelly cat, right? Like that is not the thing solely. Um, and so I think the public's imagination around what artists do is just really limited. But I think actually now that with digital technology moving so fast, this will change. Over time, it will get better. But in the meantime, one strategy we deploy at USA just kind of in our own little heads is um, you should take people that are an artist to art things. And you should be really manipulative about it. Like my brothers are engineers. They only care about the environment and construction. And so I'm very careful about what I take them to. I take them to art projects about the environment that I know will connect with them. And I think slowly it starts to dismantle what their like weird baby sister is doing over there in New York with all of her weird naked friends, right? Like this is sort of their frame. And so I'm curious about like if everyone identified like a few people in their life that don't see themselves in this space and then be very strategic about what you are taking them to and do it repeatedly until it hits them that artists are doing far more than the things that they feel alienated from. Well, I, please. I, I'm curious how you think about what responsibility the institutions have that are creating the exhibitions that you might bring your brothers to, oh for God. example. I'd be like, to, close the door. Let's have to, this conversation well, all day. To reach, yes. to reach out yeah. um, as opposed to sort of having people who feel alienated by the world. Yeah having to extend themselves, which can be a vulnerable experience. So is your question, Victoria, how do institutions bring that like, audience what in? Yeah, have you seen it done well? That's a good question. Anyone? Have I seen it done well? In, on an institutional level? Yeah. yeah, I think Four Freedoms does a great job with that. Uh, I, I mean, I think cr creative time, creative capital, um, not just saying it because I see people in the room from these places. Yeah. Um, there, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I would put Yerba Buena on that to, list. To Sorry. Yerba Buena is incredible. Yeah. Uh, I have a, even the, the Kennedy Center is doing great work right now. I, there's a Eurocentric perspective that is vested in, spe, invested in specialization. Mm -hmm. I think I, in only for the past 150 years have we really been forced to segregate ourselves. You know, like Samuel Morse even was an artist. You know, he was a failed artist who created what we now consider um, telecommunications. Um, and there are proverbs that say, if you move, can move, you can dance, if you can talk, you can sing um, f and in Africa. And I think one of the things, I, 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 for a long time, was like, I can't dance. And I can't dance because I've been taught that dancing is for dancers. Mm. And that's like saying living is for livers. And so what I'm trying to say is, how do we start to like not 
tap into the part of yourself is like, okay, you, if you are part of the human species, you can participate and contribute just by your presence and engagement to anything and make it better. Yep. And I think that's some of the things that a lot of, like Brooklyn Museum is working on, a lot of institutions are working on, even MoMA and the Met, and, and the, we, they understand that they were built through this colonial, and, and founded in this colonial context, yeah. and that in order to actually return to humanity, we have to carefully um, dismantle colonialism while acknowledging there have been some positive things that have happened over the past 150 years. So I'm, I'm really trying to, to thread that needle. Yeah, and I'll just add, um, one of the things that that question makes me think of is who do we count and who do we see as institutions, right? Mm -hmm. So one of the projects that we're up to as a laundromat project is this idea of naming for ourselves what, who are we in legacy with, as well as who we're in community with right now. So, um, you know, Someone just reminded me today that we're nearing the 100-year mark of the Harlem Renaissance. Well, I certainly think of us in legacy with that yeah. history and the Chicano art movement and the ethnic studies art movement and um, Project Row Houses that started 20, about 26, 27 years ago. And um, for us, I think about, I definitely think about the laundromat as a growing POC-centered, black-rooted institution that is about being in community with people, meeting yep. people where they are. Mm -hmm. But we also learn that and get to do that work with Project Row Houses, with settlement houses from yep. the late 1800s, with um, Asian Arts Initiative in Philadelphia, which is doing incredible work in Chinatown of Philadelphia, with the Underground Museum in yep. LA. So it's also about like who gets to be an institution yep. and what does it mean to support that uh, uh, different kinds of institutions in the context of an ecosystem where to survive and to move from survival actually to thriving mm. we've got to recognize each other and, and say oh wow that's actually work that matters as well and that we're going to trust that work we're going to value that work and the artists that we in turn get to work with and the communities that we get in turn to work with so meeting someone at a laundromat or a community center or on a billboard or whatever that is meeting people in the space that they're already in in actually is really important work and who's already doing that at the core of their mission yep. and the core of how they see themselves in the world as an organization. I think those examples that you listed, yeah. Underground, Project Rojas, Laundromat, yeah. they had an imagination about what they could be. Yeah. And then they had an imagination about their audience. Yeah. I think it wasn't, yes. the important thing with La Laundromat and Project Rojas is, is also that they are on second or third leader leadership kind of examples. And I think that's something that we haven't learned enough about is how do you build something that's revolutionary and new and different and have it that. exist beyond hmm. the crazy people who started it. So I'm curious, uh, cause you and you were at Creative Capital beforehand, yeah. so how I'm curious how that works. So for us who are trying to figure out how to like continue. What does trans leadership transition yeah. look like, which Dina might also, um, which I do think. I thought you're looking at me and I'm like, <laughs> I ask you that question all the time. <laughs> Uh -huh. um, so the founder of the Laundromat Project is a wonderful woman named Risa Wilson, for those who don't know. And she really birthed this thing. I was actually on the board very early on and then came back as a staff member after a break. Um, but had never really wanted to be the executive director. She really wanted to, had this amazing idea. She wanted to gift it to the world. And then um, I literally went in and said, I'd like to take it to the next level, whatever that looked like. I wasn't sure, but you know, it's yeah. been eight years now. And I do think it's about what is the DNA of a space. So there are so many things that we do at the, at the LP, including our first programming of Create Change, but also the sense of being committed to POC communities was there from day one. This idea of meeting people where they are was there from day one. This idea of supporting and trusting artists and particularly artists of color was there from day one. So in a way it was like recognizing value, uh, values alignment became really important and then leaving the space for that to happen. And there was again that ecosystem, there's so many folks who supported that. Mentors, uh, for me Kelly Jones and Kathy Halbreich and Ruby Lerner and, and so many folks, mainly women in my life but not only, who really supported that vision and supported, I'd never done this before, I'd never been an ED before, I went from creative capital where I was director of grants and services to like budgets and 
things that Dina and I get to talk about, like, wait, what, what, what is our coronavirus policy? Um, <laughs> and, you know, there's, there's all kinds of things that come with this, but I'm always doing it in community. And there are people who I've mentored, people who've mentored me, people I get to call, and yeah. all of that is such a big part of it to me. I, I actually want to ping this to Victoria, and then we'll open up for questions in just a second. I'm curious, you left Kickstarter to get an MBA, and now you're back in the world. Back in the world. Back in the world. And I'm curious, leadership transition, I feel like, has also been so important with you. Like, it was so clear, your mark on Kickstarter when you were designing that program, which is now still thriving in an, under new leadership. Yeah. But I'm just curious, the decision to go back to Hans question about mm -hmm. um, to go to business school to get those skills in particular and to come back into the creative world. Sure, it's a question about Kickstarter leadership transition or just me? I think the question is transition to your personal transition, the ways you are transitioning your own leadership for yourself and for the field. Sure, I think I've moved from, from an art perspective from being really in the weeds, working every single day with artists at Kickstarter, sort of seeking the broadest spectrum of what the art world could look like with a crowdfunding platform to help aid yeah. its growth, um, to really supporting, after going off to Stanford, being far away from the New York art scene, really rebuilding my roots here mm -hmm. and engaging with the community of arts organizations that helped me learn what I cared about in art. Mm -hmm. um, so I've been super invested in helping Brooklyn Museum and Creative Time with strategic plans, also Hank and Wide Awakes, which we haven't heard much about, um, but one of Hank's new, new projects in community with many others, yeah. probably many people in this room. Um, but it's been really like deepening my investment back here with, with my roots mm -hmm. um, and trying to take what I learned from business school and when I can, share it. Um, because I do think there is this, of course, capitalism and the art world are so intertwined. We're here at the Armory. Um, but there is like a mystique in both directions. Yeah. Like, what does it mean to be a business person? What does it mean to be an artist? And even though we're often all together in the same rooms, at galas, at board meetings, places like here, um, those conversations aren't happening. So, so we're starting back at home, bringing my knowledge back, seeing how I can help. That's right. Can I? Thank you. As, because uh, Victoria, you very early on, you know, joined a board and like really being in a in a position of such incredible uh, responsibility early on. And at the same time, you were volunteering and working at Kickstarter and like you've done so many different things from different perspectives and really dove in early. So I'm curious, like, what does what does being on a board like feel like or mean for you? And like, how do you? Sure, I feel really lucky yeah. every time I, I go into the Creative Time or Brooklyn Museum boardrooms and get to sit with people who, for me, have defined the cultural world as we know it. Um, people like Tracy Reese, Stephanie Ingracia, um, even being involved at the Studio Museum, getting to talk to Thelma about what it means yeah. to be building you know, a, a real institution for people of color in Harlem. I think learning from the bravery of others and also trying to take on, you know, as we think about next generation support, how do I learn from them, encourage people who are my age to want to jump in um, before we're 40 and 50, I think actually helps really um, like create some depth yeah. and board perspective. How are younger people thinking about culture and the arts? How's that changing? Having someone who's living that. Um, is a perspective that I try to bring into the rooms. That's great. Do we have any questions in the audience? Yes. <laughs> Go for it. So this is a question that plagues me all the time, and, and I really appreciated all the presentations. I often see a divide between issues of racial justice and environmental justice. And I wonder if you could address that. I, I, I think that goes back to our, the segregation that happens in our minds that I, I think we, we compartmentalize. I, I, I always wonder what would have happened if uh, the March for Our Lives and the Women's March and Black Lives Matter and um, Occupy 
had all kind of happened together and in unison rather than um, kind of in separation. I think there are, that, that the race and class and gender are divide and conquer strategies and they work very well and efficiently. So as long as we adhere to them, we participate in them and, and, and uh, kind of enliven them. Anybody else have a question? Did you want something more specific than that, or? Yeah, um, for example, climate justice. Mm -hmm. It's not just environmental justice as uh, human communities. It's a lot more complicated than that. The issue of colonialism goes straight to ecocide. Mm -hmm. So how come they are so separated if they're so obviously connected? I think Hank has a point about um, we often just kind of perpetuate the things that have already been presented. So I love what you said earlier about how do we Remake. practice freedom and like art being a space where that can happen. So I could definitely go through and say, here are some projects that we supported that brought those things together. But I think we're just living in a larger system of like really as humans, we often compartmentalize things and being able to thread through is something that I think artists have to offer in making disparate things kind of come together. And I just think it's one of the charges that we have before us, and there are many charges that we have before us that we need to kind of move forward on. But I think about the People's Climate March from five or five or so years ago, and there was particularly a number of artists and arts, artist collectives here at the time called the People's Climate PCA. Um, uh, there was a group here that uh, came out of the May Day space in Bushwick, etc., Raquel Dianda and others, who were working very much at that intersection. So it does happen, and we could probably point out those moments, but it's how do we thread that through in a bigger way, and not just about this, but how do we see the ways that we are, we are kind of fighting common enemies, and when do we get to do that together? I think it's actually powerful sometimes to do that deep work that's yep. just about the solo thing, but not if we can never figure out how to pull it together. And I think Four Freedoms does that, Laundromat Project, there are a number of places that are like, okay, we all okay. get to be in community to kind of have bigger conversations. Convenings are part of that. I actually think that's really important. So the Congress you just pulled together, those are those moments that that can happen. It's also a who gets championed. I think there are a lot of people who don't, who who are doing the work that you're talking about that don't get credit because they're not rich or famous or connected to the rich and famous. Or Julie, white. Do we have another question? Hi, so um, I'm an upcoming law student. So I wonder how does art law uh, really kind of shapes the way and how we see um, and how we cultivate a society that you were you were um, you were just telling about, like um, that is uh, detached from like the colonial spirit that we've seen art today, and also to also support artists like you all. Victoria, did you have an answer? No, I I think that I I don't know if I have the most direct answer to your question, but only that there have been many, for my Kickstarter projects, many lawyers who volunteered their time to, to have the yes and attitude mm. that I was talking about earlier. So rather than leading from a place of this is too tough, this is impossible, you're taking on too much risk, they've worked really closely with a few artists, sometimes in exchange for artworks um, or pro bono. To, to support and clear pathways. I also think having lawyers on boards is immensely helpful, and not just the boards of like major museums, but like the small local nonprofits that you really believe in. They need your services, and every artist that works with them needs your services. In a higher level, I think there's so much, like the legislation, there are so many legislative opportunities that could support artists in this country that I think there are not enough organizing efforts around to really push forward for lots of reasons. I don't know what kind of law you're going into, but tax law, like anywhere you throw a stone in any, in any part of the law, there is a way to help artists. So I think it just depends on what your unique interests are and where you think you can really get the most work done. Um, but I'd be happy to talk to you about that kind of more offline. Yeah. Any other questions? 
Uh, we got Desiree and then one over here. Hi, the question is, um, how do you guys think that funding overall for art might change? Um, you know, as you look into the future, whether it's group funding, institutions, government, private individuals, do you see, how do you think about the landscape of funding for art moving forward? Small question. <laughs> <laughs> That is a very good question and also a very tough question that I certainly do not have the crystal ball on, but um, I'm looking at Hallie Lee. Um, I, so the, the elusive thing that people try and chase is this idea of like who are the individuals that want to support this work, that care about this kind of work and are passionate about it. And I think that's a very real thing and I also think and the reason I was uh, pointing to, to Hallie, who's did a lot of work around um, donors of color, uh, which I think is really, really critical work, because there's a way, again, going to this idea of how do we practice freedom, that we, many people in this room, as well as people we're connected to, are getting closer and closer to having the resources to make a change in the world that we care about and to move us closer to the world that we want to create. And I actually think that's really important work to be, again, my word, in community with one another as people of color. This is, you know, I'm running a POC-centered organization. I'm really thinking about what, are, what is the power that we have as people who are making, creating, and supporting our own work. So what does that look like? What, how can we be in conversation together to move that? How do we organize together to do that? To, again, to create the world and support the work and the kinds of institutions that we want to put forward. And that doesn't always look like the bigger institutions, but also includes the smaller ones that are kind of doing work, possibly a little closer to the ground, where we are not always trusted to do that work. So being able to say, yes, we trust you, and here's the resources and the way that you can move forward, I actually think it's really important. So I think there's a big opportunity there, because foundations, which are incredibly important to the work we do, and so many of them have provided that space for us to move forward, but you know, things kind of shift and move. So who, again, who we're in community with and how we can kind of have conversations that move us together, I think is really important. Things like the Kickstarter that are about bringing community together around an idea. Um, the incredible uh, uh, 50 state <laughs> Kickstarter uh, campaign that Four Freedoms did, I think was just like an amazing game changer of a different way to kind of get people motivated and working together towards, again, this idea of the, pra the freedom we want to practice. So it's not not a really direct answer. I just feel there's something there about organizing community and recognizing our own power to support the world we want that feels really important from an individual space that moves into collective space more so to me than foundations and government, which I think are going to do what they do. And I think that's part of the landscape, but not the only part of the landscape. Yeah, I think building off of that, and I think it's, it's a big question. Um, that doesn't yet have a direct answer, but I think that I worry about power being in the hands of very few in general, whether it's by having board seats or being able to support even by buying an artwork. Um, and so I'm, you know, Kickstarter is one example in which financial power is distributed among many, and so they're less, you know, it, whatever is produced is less beholden to a single funder or a couple funders who have deep pockets. Um, but I also wonder if there's something to be learned from the, the work that a lot of people sort of denigrate in the art world, like the Museum of Ice Creams or um, some of the more like team lab-esque experiential work that people are willing to pay money to experience. Um, and I don't think that we have to move to follow them, but I do think that there are probably interesting lessons to be gleaned from how are, how are these, these worlds, the Museum of Ice Cream, to take one example, thinking about drawing people in and making them feel invited and as though this is something that's for them, where they can feel safe and they want to come into and have fun with their friends there. You know, are there 
are there things that we can take from that spirit where that we can monetize actually because i think right now there are great examples like the work that hank has done um, and the four freedoms team and creative time and you I, there's many examples but less so where it's been monetized and i actually think that monetization piece is really powerful um, because it it just leads to a more sustainable free way of expression yeah one of my big challenges with the current um, infrastructure, you know, the nonprofit industrial complex is um, the way in which we, many of us, including myself, have been conditioned to, uh, you know, there's that, to, to be fed fish without learning how to catch our own fish or even make our own dish. Um, and I really think think with all due respect to funding organizations and funders, many of whom have supported me, um, funding is just fertilizer. You know, it's like, I don't know any artist that's like, oh, I wanna like see if somebody will give me money before I do my project. It's like, I'm gonna do my project and hopefully somebody will give me money. And usually we frankly have been taught wrong in the art education system that once we give money, we just like put that all into the project too. We don't ever, we don't really, we've not been taught, there's no blue collar artist. There's this idea that like all the money that we get, we invest directly into our projects without ever having an idea for like self-sustaining retirement program, uh, and, uh, you know, becoming industrializing about the fact that we within our network carry, like my friends, if I look at around my, like, all of us collective, our collective net worth of my community of art friends is like $100 million. Now, most of that is in our potential that we've given away or sold to other people who aren't our, our communities. And a lot of what I think is fascinating is that we go to these foundations that have made all this money in ways that they feel get bad about and we feel bad about, <laughs> and then ask them to give us money so that we can prove to them that we're doing a good job where I'm like, this is just, they should be coming to us and say, like, you're doing a good job. Can we help you? And so I'm really trying to, like, without, without arrogance, be like, move away from this kind of hands out to arms open um, relationship. Uh oh, Marsha. I love what you just said there, but why can't we talk about the fact that this found the administrative burden on foundational uh, applications for small organizations makes it so that they are no they're not actually a go-to and the idea that you build it and they will come we don't all have the luxury of just building it and they will come some of us do because we realize we cannot wait on the whole cycle but if enough of us know about it like why are we locked out of basic arts funding for ideas that culturally you absolutely want and we have to prove before you, you what, the, like the gatekeepers have to be fixed. I, I just feel that we, we can dance around it. Gatekeepers don't have the power to actually support then, what they want to support. Then, then the model's broken. It's True. broken. Can we just talk about that instead of how we're going to do things outside of that? There, there's, there's, there's a lot. You know, mm. I just, there, <laughs> there's also an entire, you know, back to what Victoria was saying, there's an entire model of earned income, which, hi. <laughs> Huffing or puffing over here in this aisle. <laughs> um, you know, which which I am, you know, eagerly participating in in the role that I play on my. In What's my your little, job? I'm the head of product development at the Whitney. Hi. <laughs> um, you know, and it's a really successful model that we use, and um, it's you not know, replicated enough. Well, and but we do it, and we do it really well, and we do it on behalf of artists and every artist who we work with. Um, you know, derives revenue from the products that we make and we create revenue for the museum and, you know, and it's, there are ways of doing it, f you know, in larger, in larger measure for lots of kinds of organizations and it doesn't have to be a museum of ice cream model for, you know, a for-profit enterprise. It should be replicated across lots of, you know, and it's, and it is earned, you know, these are not, you know, it is, it is participatory and, the retail model is one that can work across a lot of different, uh, a lot of different places, and uh, museums are places that some people feel comfortable. But the retail model is a place where a lot of people feel comfortable, and it's a it's a place where lots of people's shoulders drop, 
and people feel comfortable touching things and asking questions and picking things up and where there are things that cost five dollars and things that cost five thousand dollars and um, you know there's a it's a it's a model that that sure there's lots of people who have been blocked out of but lots of people have also been included in and I think there's a real community aspect to that as well. Sorry. I think Julia there's another question right up here. Yeah, hi. I was um, thinking of the um, the title of the panel exactly, and um, my idea was that there are actually many ways or many places where uh, fun can be uh, are available for art. There are a lot of uh, foundations, a lot of of uh, uh, there are a lot of places, but there was this problem of access, not availability. It's there. There are many companies, many. There's, it's there, but the access is not so, so clear or so simple. And the way that um, the artists always challenge the system, the way the curators challenge the system, the way now art fairs are challenging the system in terms of their position with in, in front of pioneers, for example, there may be something to be said in terms of uh, how to approach uh, the idea of funding, and specifically in terms of access. Uh, it's the same question of whether we need more women in the field or maybe whether we just need equal possibility of access for women in the field in order to the field to be, to be better. And this is what I think this, this should be. Maybe it's, it's an idea because I, I look at the panel and what's said and I, I don't see, like for example, an analysis of the state of things now in terms of funding and maybe who is in this area challenging the way things are and the way things are organized. And when I hear this woman here says that maybe the, the system is broken, maybe it's not broken, maybe, but maybe some other ideas and different ways of looking at it uh, should, be, should be thought of. If it's not broken, We are living in a fantastic world and just haven't realized it. Yeah. I think a couple of things to address your last point, if that's okay. I'm um, done though. Oh, are you not done, really? You, you took a dramatic first. pause. Go first. Like the world's worst moderator. Go ahead. <laughs> I, may, do you agree that money for artists is scrutinized more than money possibly going to any other industry right now? No. You don't think that? How many people think that's true from their vantage points who have friends in other sectors, environment, education, climate, et cetera? Okay, so I'm on the camp that agrees. I'd love to hear why you don't. Um, I, I think that, again, having an imagination around what money could do in the cultural sector does not match up to what foundations are asking for from small nonprofits at the time that they are pitching themselves for that funding. I think the system, I don't know if it's broken. I think it is, personally but I understand that it is working for some people, it isn't working for everyone, and it isn't accessible to everyone. Back to your point about the Whitney's earned income model. At United States Artists, we developed a way to earn income that has really taken the pressure off of us for the last two years, but I recognize when I talk about it that I'm like, that would not work for 40 million, so much of my colleagues, right? So what, how is everybody thinking about hacking their own funding system while we get there? I, earlier this year, there was an op-ed written by four major foundation donors that talked about how it was unethical to ask nonprofits to do things at 20% of their general operating budget. I think there is a small and subtle movement happening with some more innovative foundation leadership that will affect who gatekeeps and how and what for over time. We're just not there yet. I think for individuals and some of the other models you mentioned, corporations, in my view, the imagination there is startlingly lacking, and it's more about time, how much time it takes artists to do things. From my vantage point, is not reflected around corporations and individuals. I think that uh, we are facing the largest intergenerational wealth pass our nation has ever seen. I think the country's relationship towards wealth and capitalism is shifting in the public's imagination. And I think my little advice about people taking someone you kind of know maybe would go to an art thing if you could manipulate them, the rich need to do that tenfold. Like when we fundraise, and I talk to an individual donor who says, I tried to get my friend to support some of this work by United States artists, any of the boards you sit on, your friends and colleagues, 
but sorry, they really care about like women's reproductive health. And I'm like, let me show you 9,000 artists that are participating in the fight for women's reproductive health. So I think the wealthy need to put pressure on their friend group to think about the arts with more imagination than just museums and or the art market or fairs. But I think that all comes from us to pressure people. And why do you not think art is scrutinized more than other things? I think it's under supported for its value to our society grossly. Uh, you grossly. don't think you get the question all the time? What I will mean, this do? How will it change? How will it fix? I mean, both you and you didn't give me no money for like 10 years when I was applying for those applications. Uh, I got rejected for 10 years between creative t capital and our Americans, I mean, and United States artists. Mm. I'm not bitter at all. <laughs> Wouldn't have guessed. Mm -mm. He's also not lying. <laughs> um, that's a lot of rejection. Um, and I think, frankly, what I learned was there were some good things like people saying like, okay, there was scrutiny and apparently I wasn't given the right answers. Uh, but at the same time, a lot of the people who, I, who got the money and got support um, never finished their projects or their projects are still in progress. And I think a lot of the time it's when with the few institutions that do support artists are doing it because they believe in the artist not necessarily because they want a return on investment the same way that if, if I was going to get Series A funding from in, in, in uh, Silicon Valley, if I was trying to do, go to a bank and get a loan, the level of scrutiny as a small business would be much, much higher and is what I wish we had more in the training for artists in these, in, in these spaces is how to speak and relate to uh, different kinds of investors to get a, a larger amount of support and then also make it more beneficial. So even if you guys had given me the $50,000, it would have been spent uh, mm -hmm. before I even got it, largely because of the application process and the amount, how long it takes to go through it. And then like, but at the same time, then now, okay, I got it. I spent it on the project. Next year, the project still needs to be, got, be done and now I have to start over. So I, I don't know. I, I've gotten a lot of money that I think we and my collaborators, I don't say we wasted, but I don't, I realize that if we'd had a better understanding of how money works and how to turn money into money, you know, I think about Master P who's like, I got a loan for $10,000, I turned it into $100 million. Like, how do we, I think a lot more about how few artists I know have been able to turn the foundation money that they got into a viable business. Uh, I don't know. No, I, I agree with Hank 100%, where in most fields, like heart isn't enough of a reason to support someone. And here, I think so often, that is why someone is given funding, because they fall in love with Hank, and they are just ready to support him on whatever he does next without a lot of scrutiny at all. Um, and then I think one thing, though, that I think is worth I know we're ending, but just pushing back on a little bit is this idea that by bringing people in to museums and institutions that they're going to want to support them just by seeing. And I think that our institutions in the most expansive way that we can talk about institutions are often not speaking the language of how people absorb and celebrate culture today. Mm -hmm. And I think if we don't address that gap, we're not going to be able to convince people to part with their dollars to support the next, the next thing that's going to get made. And so I think that work is, is often what needs to be done. And I, I worry about the denigration of things that you know, I also don't like, like the Museum of Ice Cream and, and, and that world. I know that's, yeah. but I think instead of sort of turning our back on that and saying, ew, that's not us, um, really saying what can be learned from the way in which they've been able to draw people in is important for our future survival. And also we should point out that Manish had worked in, very, one of the founders of the Museum of Ice Cream had worked in various kind of organizations in, within the art world and realized that there was a way to reach a broader audience and they had incredible success in that. And yeah. I think, you know. Well, please join me in thanking our panelists today. Thank you. Yeah. Enjoy the rest of the armory. Thank you. Thank you.